mute. Wonderful. Thank you very much for pointing this out. Okay. Again, hello everyone. Good afternoon to the folks in Australia and good evening to folks uh, East Coast or, or in Europe. Uh, from wherever you are joining me, I'm very glad to have the privilege of your time. I am Animesh Gurg and I am a professor at the University of Toronto and I work in the area of reasoning and prediction for robot learning. And today I'm going to talk to you about a particular recent line of work uh, where, which I believe is very important for not just robotics in, let's say, toy domains, but actually practical applications in causal, uh, causal systems um, uh, and practical applications in building applications such as space robots. So a lot of the motivation of my work comes from, well, uh, things that are very close to home, something that is very obvious to everybody, uh, kitchen or household jobs. And what we really want is these kind of systems that can do a lot of tasks that's important, right? A variety of tasks, not just one-off tasks. Uh, do them in a number of diversity of scenes, uh, things that you have seen, things that you may not have seen in terms of objects, and then do them in more complex settings that you have seen. So maybe you had a party and the sink is fuller than usual, or maybe uh, the child forgot to do, do laundry and so on and so forth, right? Now, it's not as if we don't know how to do low level control or skills. Uh, Boston Dynamics is one particularly sort of impressive example of building uh, these systems, but they are not the only ones, of course. But the interesting thing is, even when you take this hardware and you put this in interesting domains, uh, which are, ever so slightly semantic and you have to do tasks. Uh, the world fails. It turns out building real world robots with real world perception for real use cases is really hard. So the question really is, how do we need, or what do we need to do to achieve this algorithmic generalization? And this generalization really means across objects, scenes, semantics, task goals, and so on and so forth. So one would argue that large scale supervision uh, has really accelerated machine learning in uh, computer vision, in language. Uh, and, and I argue that this large scale supervision has not really translated to similar gains in, um, in our domains, uh, particularly in robotics, even more so in physical robots. So now what I argue is the solution to this problem uh, should or will consist of two building blocks. One is this idea of causal inductive biases and structured priors, and then how to use this. I believe it will be a two-step process. One is this idea of task specification through imitation. You should be able to specify hard learning-based tasks uh, through some sort of natural mechanism. It can be video super, uh, or, or language. And then the robot or the algorithm should have enough understanding or structure in the system to be able to generalize this instruction to new but similar use cases. Okay, so these are according to me the two building blocks that needs to sort of happen for true algorithmic centralization uh, with systems. And uh, over the years, uh, my work has been motivated by, evaluated on, and has been applied to a different set of domains. I started in surgical robotics. I worked with robot arms in service and manufacturing setups. Uh, and then I've recently been working on legged locomotion in uh, even uneven terrains of unknown terrains. What I'm gonna to talk to you about today is primarily algorithms, uh, not worrying about the details of applications yet, uh, which will cover three main things. And then we will uh, start with how to learn from data. We'll try to figure out how causality shows up when you want to learn from data. How do we learn this causality? And finally, how do we close this loop to actually build practical systems? So let's start with the first question. The question number one is, can we do policy learning in sandbox from data? No interaction. Why? Because this will probably be safe. We already have a lot of data. We don't want to do reinforcement learning with real robot systems like Mars rovers, right? So we want to learn from data. So now, uh, this is joint work with a number of colleagues at Stanford, uh, NVIDIA, uh, and, um, and Toronto. So what's the problem? The problem is we have a system which can collect a lot of data. So we created uh, in our prior work uh, a system where you can use basically an iPhone or any phone for that matter and do teleoperation of a full 6 dof robot. Anybody can do it. That was the whole point. This allowed us to 
scale uh, data collection to 10 times that anybody has seen in this sort of domain. So we were able to collect maybe 100, 150 hours of data uh, in about one day or of, uh, let's say, platform usage. Just to compare this, uh, equivalent data sets at the time were 10x smaller. The question we were asking was, now, given this data, can a robust and performant policy be learned purely from experiences rather than trying out anymore? So I'm trying to reduce this problem to data only without actually doing trial and error. Okay, so what is the problem here? We have a data set and we want to do policy learning. But uh, it's not that this is the first time people are trying this. The interesting thing in robot manipulation is data when coming from several humans uh, and sparse rewards, because you do not know what ex exactly is the underlying reward model that the user is using, you get a lot of interesting ways. So you get an interesting ways to fail and you get interesting ways to succeed. So you, ha you have a lot of uh, suboptimality and you have diversity. And, and that is very natural when you, when you see these sort of like trajectories. Notice we are getting full trajectories of people teleoperating, not just success or a failure. Rates. So what we have is uh, a set of demonstrations and what we can do is uh, create an algorithm which uses the data to predict a local goal. This is equivalent to saying that if you want trying to go to the airport, the plan that you have is some sort of hierarchy of uh, plans, which is basically saying to get to the airport, you will go to a certain key point or a goal, maybe go to the station, go to the next highway exit, and then a low level planner figures out how to get to that point. So this is sort of the structure that is embedded in the algorithm. The way this sort of works out is given a particular uh, state and a final goal, the agent imagines many potential paths. So this can be, should I take the train or should I take the highway? Each of these paths is then evaluated for their value which will probably be faster. So I'm not operating at low levels yet. I'm operating in high level latent abstract spaces. So I'm basically thinking about which of these paths would be better. Based on them, I select one of them. Based on the selection, I actually figure out what the low level policy is to get to these uh, intermediate key points. We tried this on a number of domains, uh, very simple sort of point robot domains, uh, simple block lifting domains, and then trying to do something that is more uh, let's say something that you'd see in storage in warehousing. So what I'm gonna show you is basically two baselines. BC is behavior cloning. BCQ is a recent state-of-the-art algorithm. Uh, and IRIS is our method. And what we see is purely from data in simple tasks, we can get a policy that can operate at 80% success. This is very important because there is no reinforcement learning here. Uh, all of the learning is happening purely in a sandbox. Uh, in more harder cases, we see that while other methods completely fail, regardless of the data set, we can get reasonable amounts of success. This is very important because you can warm start policies here rather than starting from complete scratch. The same idea can be applied to inputs as images. So now we basically learn a representation of the images as key points. Uh, this task agnostic unsupervised representation enables us to learn uh, state spaces where the robot should go without explicitly specifying, let's say this is a detector or this is pose estimations. And we can we observe that we actually get better performance than full states because the system is a bit more robust because of end-to-end -end training. Of course, now in terms of qualitative behaviors, if you'd see uh, the kind of behaviors these systems fail are what is called covariate shifts. So you might see successful data, but when you actually try to imitate it, you go off policy and soon uh, your policy or your predictive model cannot do anything about it. In our case, because the model is predicting values, uh, the model has a mechanism to correct itself. So qualitatively, they look of course successful. So what, what we've talked about is, Yes, there are methods and algorithms. This is uh, one algorithm, but there are similar other algorithms where large data sets are very effective in offline RL training. The only question is you need reasonably large data sets, not one or two hours, but hundreds of hours. Okay, so the next question is, well, can we do better? Can we do better with the use of our data? So this is uh, a paper that we had at NeurIPS last year, which is uh, a few months ago, actually last month rather. Uh, where the idea was that 
how can we use data better? Uh, if we have some data, can we do relabeling of data to generate even more data or to think about or imagine more data? So this idea is called data augmentation in reinforcement learning. And uh, this is something that also appears by the name of goal relabeling. So think of it like this, that instead of trying to do one task, if you are trying to go to a particular point, you assume that was the goal and, and you basically label the data as if uh, that was the correct goal and post post. So this is basically a very simple thing. And you can do this both in images as well. People do randomization in images. What we basically did is we come up with a clean and a generic framework of data augmentation where you can imagine new goals given a fixed data set. What, it, what you're doing is something like this. Let me just give you an example. Oops. Uh, actually, it'll be very easy with an example. So let's assume you are playing a simple game of pool and you have two data points a blue ball and an orange ball giving it trajectory. Now, of course, you can learn on just these two examples, but perhaps this is not enough. Can I imagine a third example, which is correct technically, but I have not seen. So in this case, I can combine two objects that are non-interacting uh, with in this setup to create a third new hallucinated example. So this is the data augmentation. Now, the interesting thing is, that this hallucination is not generically true. Basically, there are parts of the state space where they are actually interacting. And if you just do A plus B and cut and paste, uh, this would not work. So now you have to figure out when is this possible and when is this not through learning a local causal model. Once you have learned a local causal model, you can add new hallucinated data to the system. So this is the idea where Globally, the system is actually not dependent or not independent. It's dependent because they do interact at some point of time. But in many parts of the state space, they are independent. By doing so, you can augment data uh, without actually asking your model to visit every part of the state space, especially if you're operating in high dimensional states. So a very good example is two hands. If you can do pouring with one hand and writing with one hand, then uh, in another example, this hand could be also doing pouring and it does not matter because your two hands are independent. Only when they are operating together should you not do uh, hallucination. So we can learn this local causal model. Once you learn this local causal model, you have to figure out which samples to keep and which samples to reject, which is basically learning a notion of local causality. Okay. Now let's start with a very simple game. We started playing with Pong. Pong is a very simple video game uh, that is part of uh, Atari game suit. And you have two paddles, one ball. You have a fixed size of data set. Uh, so you start with, let's say, 25,000 examples. And now what you see here uh, on, on my screen is uh, we are adding new data, hallucinated data. So one real to one coda. So we added 25,000 points, one real to three coda, one real to five coda, and so on and so forth. And what we really see here is that given a particular data set size, adding two to five times of data set, two to five times of hallucinated data improves performance to a point where you can actually get the same level of performance with less than half the data. And of course, this was very simple use cases. This performance actually jumps much more when you have realistic robots. So now, the task is to basically go grab an object and put it in some place. And in this case, what we see is uh, this method with data augmentation can beat uh, state-of-the-art HER uh, -E method. HER -E was the hierarchical um, hindsight replay, uh, experience replay, sorry, uh, hindsight experience replay uh, by two to five X. This is very important, particularly when the tasks you are doing are hard. Uh, where sample efficiency matters a lot. Okay, so the second question we found the answer to was, doing causal data augmentation can improve sample efficiency performance of our batch RL algorithms. Now, the next question that I want to ask is, well, how can we learn this structure automatically, the causal structure? In the previous cases, the causal structure was simple. Can we do this for more complex cases? So let's play this game here. So what we wanted to do is now look at 
the question of causal discovery in physical systems. Right now, let's not worry about decision making because decision making we can do with any of the previous algorithms. Right now, we are trying to figure out can we learn the physics model through discovery rather than explicit specification. Let's play a very simple game. I'm going to give you two seconds to guess the model. As you might guess, this is a very simple uh, equation of physics. One ball bouncing on a flat surface, perhaps with no damping, because you see it bouncing back at the same height. Let's make this slightly more interesting. So now you can say that there are three balls in a box with collisions, but there is no damping because collisions seem to be completely energy preserved. Let's make it even more interesting. You might be able to generalize that, oh, uh, at this point, there are five balls. Uh, different colors may mean that they have different masses. They're still in a box and, and damping. Let's make it a bit more interesting. How about guess this now? Look at the balls carefully. They don't always go to the wall. This is also five balls in a box, but now there seem to be unknown connections in there. It turns out that this model is trickier to guess because there are latent mechanisms. There are springs, there are rigid rods and strings, things that you don't see, but still control these things. Now, the question is, how do I discover this? Not only do I need to discover this in this particular setting, I need to be able to do this generally. I cannot memorize this because every new use case or every new case might have underlying mechanisms that control these balls. Now here, the state is visible because the balls, uh, the position of the balls and the velocity of the balls is state. And then you are controlling the interactive uh, balls by saying that the only thing latent is the mechanism. How about a harder task? Now, I ask you to model this particular object. Now you might say that, oh, but we can model this through a complete FEM model. But I might argue that FEM model is overkill. You, you might be able to do this with a much less uh, dense model. So in this case, people, people would say, oh, but we have seen laundry folding robots forever. Uh, is, doesn't there a policy sort of exist? Yes, but a policy may exist for this yellow shirt with this sleeve length and this visualization. How about if you need to fold pants? or maybe pantsuits. Uh, um, how about things where the connectivity structure is not obvious? Uh, these are tops and dresses from women. It took me some time to figure out how to fold them. I don't think or imagine that the robot will be able to even figure out what is this? Is this a napkin or a shirt? So why? Why discover causality? It's basically this idea that curiosity uh, and uh, Curiosity can be explained through our understanding of physics and, and our ability to predict physics. Uh, causality enables a generalization that is much beyond memorization or even analytical physical models. Gener generalization through reinforcement learning requires a lot of data to learn. On the contrary, analytical physical models may be too tricky to specify or very hard to register. So if I give you a piece of cloth, it may be very hard to actually register your simulated model onto the piece of cloth directly. So the question is, can we discover what is called sufficient physics rather than complete physics? So in this case, we propose the model where we start with visual observations in a system. We build a perceptual representation that is task agnostic in terms of key points. It is enough to reconstruct the scene. Then we learn a latent generative model based on these key points, which is the causal graph of the model. And based on this causal graph, we build a dynamics model that predicts the future given this causal graph. Now, let me show you what the perception model looks like. You start with an input, uh, let's say a set of blocks. And what you're seeing is basically, uh, if I budget, if I give the budget five points, then each of the two points are associated with one block. And what you notice is, that when the, these blocks are overlaid, or just the blocks and their covariance matrix, and using these blocks, you can reconstruct the image. Uh, the image is not sharp, but notice that the primary objective is to actually represent the image in these key points so that you can build the causal model. You can assume these key points as your state estimates, but here the state is on latent variables. Okay. The same thing, of course, can be done on uh, the ball environment and other environments as well. 
uh, one important thing that I do want to mention is there is no loss specification. This is generic for all environments. It is self-supervised loss through reconstruction. So you need to learn a representation of the environment such that the predicted frames are reasonably good. Now what we do is we build this causal model that in the same way I described earlier. And we tried this on two different domains. One is this balls domain where the state is visible, but the mechanisms are not. And the fabrics environment where the, even the state is not visible and the fabrics are also unknown because now the stitching pattern tells you uh, what the connectivity structure is. And aside from the stitching pattern, the fabric stiffness can change. Uh, so, so changing from let's say cotton to nylon changes things, okay? So let's look at what sort of things are discovered in this case. So this is the ground truth causal graph of a set of balls bouncing around. Our model discovers a graph that is very similar, not exact. What you see on the top left or top right is basically predicted key point movements as stars overlaid. Uh, and then there are ground truth key point movements. Ground truth key points are just frame by frame while predict predictions assume that you only see first few frames and then keep on predicting in the future. Because this model is generic, uh, you can expand it to more balls than it has been trained on. So you, it was trained on three, four, five, and now it's doing out of sample evaluation on seven balls. Of course, this is a very simple example uh, to show that the model has the ability uh, to predict more complex distributions than it had seen. Interestingly, because we are doing causal discovery, we can do extrapolation, which is usually much harder with simplistic deep learning systems. So now we can do the kinds of Accuracy on edge type, if edge type is uh, a completely different setup. So edge type as in null, spring, or rigid. Uh, because this is discovery and there is no supervision, you can only get correlation to physics parameters. You are essentially discovering that there exists a, a spring and the spring operates with these parameters. You haven't specified that this is a spring and then dis discover the spring. So you can only get correlation with parameters. Similarly, correlation with length of rigid rod. Uh, so rigid rod is of course very simple a mechanism, hence the correlation is very high, while the correlation with the length of spring changes because spring has spring constant and the length. Regardless, what we find out is our model predicts much better compared to state-of-the-art interaction and graph-based neural networks. Interestingly, you can do what is called counterfactual. This is exactly what we were saying earlier, that you need mechanism to generate new data that you have not seen. So in this case, what would be new data? I see one ball. I imagine that what if the spring was 2x stiff or what if the length of the spring was 3x? I need to be able to do that and then predict the future. How good is that prediction is what is measured here. So purple is basically training distributions and, and pink is uh, out of distribution extrapolations in different variables, rest length of spring, length of rigid relation, and by changing the edge type itself. So what if there was no spring, but actually uh, a rigid rod instead? So qualitatively, what this means is, uh, you can start with a single model instead of having specific models per, per item or even per class, which will predict all of this. You, can, you only need to specify a budget. The budget here is 10 points, and you are basically able to model, let's say, a tower. The same 10 points can now be rearranged and can also learn a pant or a shirt model. And notice that nothing here is memorized. Uh, everything is at test time. You can very easily uh, do it in a manner where, for example, if the shirt sleeve length varies, uh, the model can still do it. Uh, same goes with pants. Pants become shorts or a towel becomes a bed sheet. As long as topology, of course, remains the same. So now, the question that we started was, can we learn this structure automatically? And the answer seems to be learning causal graphs or structured causal models uh, can be very efficient in enabling this. Now to put all of this together, this algorithmic things together to a realistic system, how do we build practical systems with these ideas? What we really need is this idea of learning with safety. This is something that uh, Tim, was mentioning earlier today, how do we do safety not only during, or not only during execution, but during training? How do I ensure that I have my robot, 
I just purchased this fancy robot and the fancy robot is going to do something for me, uh, but I want to make sure that the robot will not break while I'm playing. Right? This is something that would be important even more so when the assets are very expensive. So what is the challenge? The challenge is RL by design is a learning paradigm that involves trial and error. How should, a how should an agent learn without uh, performing errors? Well, it could perform, it could respect constraints. Well, where do constraints come from? One way to think about this can be, uh, as a user, I will give it demonstration of successful runs, but then there will be covariate shift. When, uh, whenever I'm training my system to only see successes, when it sees the failure first time, it will fail spect spectacularly. Uh, similarly, someone might say, oh, but I can always specify heuristics. Heuristics can be of the order, don't drive very close to the wall at, at speed X, or if the incline is more than 15 degrees, don't go there, or so on and so forth. But then these things are slightly expert in, expertise intensive in the sense you have, to, you have to know what you're doing. And this specification is very task and environment specific. How do I, do, uh, how do I build an algorithm that is reasonably generic? One idea can be controlled failures. So I want to have failures, but during training, so that I can generalize to similar failures during test. This is equivalent to saying, if I get burnt during, during training, I know that I need to avoid getting burnt during test. How does this work? Uh, this works basically by saying that, aside from the true task cost or reward model, let's add one more cost function. The cost function is basically death. I should fear death. What should I do? There is catastrophic failure where plus one and zero, that's all the signal you get. Uh, so the examples are quadruped is trying to walk, but loses balance and falls, or a robot arm is pushing a jug across a table, but the jug basically topples in space. So what I want to do now is estimate a value function of my current states, which says how close is death or how likely I am to fail given I'm this current state. Now what I do is I change my true RL objective, the usual RL objective with an additional constraint. Now I'm basically saying that the probability of failure should be bounded. If I can do that, if I can solve this constraint RL problem, then I'm basically saying that at every policy iterate, I will, I'm not likely to fail while achieving the true objective. How do I do this? In practice, what you can do is you can reject every time Reject an action every time you believe that this action will lead you towards failure. That's it, right? Of course, you can do fancier things as well, but just this is the gist. Not only is this uh, algorithm empirically easy to understand and implement, this comes with two guarantees. One, constraint is satisfied during each iterate. So this is important. We are guaranteeing that uh, the safety constraint is active and satisfied with some probabilistic guarantee during training which is very important. Usually people can only do this at the end. Two, by adding this constraint, safety constraint, we are not making the process of learning too slow. So the loss of performance is bounded. So there is the no, no free lunch argument. So let's look at two very simple examples. One example is pushing uh, across a table where you want, don't want the box to fall off. And the, the other one is pushing the box across, but now you don't want it to topple. And notice that as it reaches the boundary, the, the robot becomes slow and still moves it close to the boundary to achieve the result. In a more practical setup, you can think of asking the robot, learning the robot, requiring the robot to learn to walk. To do that, what you could do is, instead of directly trying to walk, maybe you say, how about we start with standing from, uh, uh, from uh, zero position, just keep standing with perturbations. Uh, what you see in the ghost image is basically arbitrary goal positions in that pose. Once you know how to, how to stand, you can go from stand to walk. Notice one thing that I did mention is earlier in this setup, when we are training in simulation, you are only experiencing failure in zero one, but it's not required that that's the only constraint. You can have multi-objective where I can specify some constraints as heuristics and also have failures. And both of them can be included as two constraints. And our setup will allow such specification. So now what we said is, you can put together all of these ideas where you have learned from data. You can, 
improve performance on the, that given data set and uh, learn causality and finally learn this in a manner that is guaranteed or provably safe. So with that, I would like to bring this to a close. Uh, hopefully, uh, the big picture takeaway here is building causal models and discovering causal structure can enable us to build much more efficient and generalizable algorithms. And studying safety in the context of these generalizable algorithms allows us to build practical robot systems, which would probably be uh, the kind that we would like to deploy uh, in space. Thank you.